First, let me thank Professor Vanderburg um, for um, organizing all of this rather at the spur of the moment, uh, at the very last minute, uh, and she pulled it all together brilliantly. And I'd also like to thank um, assistants um, Julia Dietrich and Moritz Wiedeenders, who have brought all kinds of assistance, including technical assistance, um, to this evening. Um, so if the PowerPoint mucks up, it's my fault, not theirs. Um, so it's my understanding uh, that my job here today is to explain the 2016 US presidential election or what the hell's going on over there, meaning that something is going on that is not understandable. I must say that I am moved and flattered that you think something understandable should be going on over there, a presumption uh, of rationality somewhat at odds with the American historical record. Actually, it's at odds with all historical records because people are not motivated primarily by reason. So my first point is, What's going on in the US is the same not understandable thing that always goes on. The Trump election was not exceptional, and therein lies the point. From socio-political moves that are ordinary may come substantial change. It worked. The election was, in fact, not only ordinary, but as American as apple pie, indeed a matter of our civil religion. Sociologist Robert Bella identified several biblical archetypes in America's civil creed, the Exodus chosen people, promised land, New Jerusalem, and sacrificial death and rebirth. In my remarks, I will talk about this civil faith, about its fervor or enthusiasm, its commitment to the new and rejection of the old, and its application to Trump and to what we can expect from his policies and appointments. First, fervor. Problems, because they are with us, tend to be concrete and measurable. But solutions, as they project into the future, are a matter of belief. Americans, heir to people so devout they crossed an ocean to stay true to their principles, have faith in what will save the day. This is not Brussels bureaucracy or muddling through with Merkel. In America, it's the economy stupid when we're describing problems, but when it comes to solutions, beliefs count. The problems facing Trump voters are that they are being squeezed out of the globalized, technology-driven, high-skill economy and the culture accompanying it. But before we tell a doomsday story, we should note that the US economy has steadily improved since 2009. Jobs have increased for 75 months in a row, the longest sustained record of growth since 1939. Mostly in full-time employment, and with those who are working part-time when they don't want to be working part-time, that percentage has fallen 2%. Unemployment is down to 4.7%. Hourly wages have risen, especially for low-income earners. 3.5 million people rose above the poverty line last year. That's the biggest drop in poverty since 1999. In September, the number of people working increased by 440,000, meaning, why is this important? Meaning those who have left the labor market in the recession are returning to jobs. The annual median household income rose to 56,500, up 5.2%, the largest rise since 1967. On the other hand, this improvement is not distributed equally, and the long-term trends are disturbing. Many Americans feel sidelined or fear that they or their children soon will be sidelined as the jobs that they're familiar with fade away. Fear of loss is a powerful motivator. Loss of material or emotional well-being, loss of a sense that one understands how the world works, and loss of the sense that one has some control over one's life. The Wall Street Journal analyzed the Trump vote this way. Trump rides a blue collar wave. 55% of his supporters are white working class. Yet Trump voters included those in the middle classes 
who too are experiencing an economic squeeze as middle-class purchasing power has stayed flat since the 1980s under Ronald Reagan, while costs of education, health care, and much else have risen. Middle-class families with both parents working feel that they cannot save for their kids' college educations, pay the health care bills, and save for their own retirement all at the same time. Average pre-tax earnings of the bottom 50% of Americans rose 2.6% over the last 40 years, 2.6. The pre-tax earnings of the top 10%, the top 10% rose by 231% over the same time. Upper middle class income has also not grown in the last 15 years. Today, the US has less upward mobility than Canada and Europe and is the most unequal of all Western uh, nations. Our Gini, or inequality, index is 85.1 in line with Russia, India, Indonesia, and Kazakhstan. The top 20% of households own over 84% of the wealth. The bottom 40% own 0.3%. CEO to worker pay ratio is 354 to 1. 50 years ago, it was 20 to 1. Yet the difference in the tax rates between the top 1% and the bottom 50% has narrowed from a 30-point difference to a 12-point difference as the tax rates for the upper income earners have been lowered for a more regressive tax rate. While children born in 1940 had a 92% chance of earning more than their parents, children born in 1980 have a 50% chance of doing so. In sum, both working and middle class are motivated by the present economic squeeze and by the fear of continuing decline, loss of control, and sense of powerlessness facing a government seemingly unresponsive to these concerns, government, by the way, um, over the last 40 years in both parties. But these economic features were key to the campaigns of all the candidates. What captures votes in the United States is not ec our economic sins, but beliefs about the path to salvation, about how to fix them. In America, salvation involves what Robert Bella called sacrificial death and rebirth, not only starting anew, but rejecting the old. This, after fervor, is the second article of our religious faith. Cast out the corrupt. We hear echoes of this in the preacher's rid ye of the devil, and traces in the parallel political call to throw the bastards out. It was loud in the Trump campaign, but emerges in alternate form in democratic positions as well. Populist demands grow loud when the bastards are identified as Washington insiders, constrainer of personal liberty, corrupt and incompetent. Nativist demands increase when the bastards are immigrants or other suspect groups. Every society has a coterie of groups that are traditionally suspect, we in the United States do too. In both populist and nativist versions, a troubled world will be set right when evil for forces are purged from the body politic. To the populist form first. When Obama was elected, opponents branded him a fascist and a communist. Now, it's not easy to be both at once, but Americans fear the same thing in both, government control. Whoever persuades the nation that he will keep the government small and individual opportunity large wins hearts and minds. Americans across the continent, class, religion, and race respect individualist, hardworking, risk-taking self-responsibility. They respect local voluntary associations, as Tocqueville called them, that get things done without help from outsiders, and they disdain freeloaders who rely on controlling government meddlers. Good things have come from this anti-authoritarianism. A, crit a, a critique of inherited privilege and of status quo ways of thinking, a willingness to develop new ways of life, and a robust sense of self-responsibility. 
but it has also brought an unreflective hostility to government programs and to people, immigrants, African Americans, whom some Americans fear do not share their values of responsible self-reliance. We can think of it this way. Government in America, wait a minute, am I on the right? Yes. We can think of it this way. Government in America is what religion is in Germany and other countries in Western Europe. Suspect, unter Verdacht. Europeans constrain religion so that it may not impose its benighted, tyrannical power on the state, assumed to be secular, rational, and democratic. Americans, by contrast, constrain the state so that it may not impose its tyrannical will on democratic society, we the people. When facing problems, Germans say the government should throw the bastards out. Well, Americans say, throw out the bastards in government.